Good evening. My name is Patrick Lewis, and I'm the Director of Collections and Research at the Filson Historical Society. I'm so glad you joined us this evening. The Filson would like to thank the Thomas W. Bullitt Perpetual Charitable Trust for sponsoring this evening's lecture. I'm very happy tonight to introduce our speaker, Barry Craig. Barry Craig is Professor Emeritus of History at West Kentucky Community and Technical College in Paducah, the author of seven books on Kentucky history and co-author of two more, his latest book, the subject of tonight's talk, is Kentuckians in Pearl Harbor, Stories from the Day of Infamy, just out from the University Press of Kentucky. Craig is a native of Mayfield, where he and his wife of 41 years live. He received a bachelor's degree in history and a master's degrees in history and journalism from Murray State University. He was on the WKCTC faculty for 24 years and still teaches online classes, including one on World War II. I'll now turn the program over to Professor Craig and then rejoin him after the presentation to moderate questions. Thank you very much, Patrick. I hope I did this right. Uh, I turned 71 on uh, December the 7th and I'm a little bit uh, not exactly tech savvy, but I enjoy this very much. And I've been to the Philson and enjoyed that very much. And I appreciate your, your kind remarks. And I'm really glad that a Western Kentuckian, a fellow Western Kentuckian, a Trigg County in your case, has such an august position with the uh, Filson. I was well into writing what became my book when my wife remarked, you know, you've never written about a place you've never been. It didn't take much coaxing to get us on a plane headed for Hawaii. It was, in many respects, an emotional trip for us. On more than one occasion, we wept. Melinda's dad, the late Robert Hawker Jr. of Arlington, Kentucky, where we're moving, was a Master Sergeant in Army Intelligence, and he was stationed at Schofield Barracks on Oahu, inland from Pearl Harbor, until he shipped out to the Philippines, to Iwo Jima and Okinawa. My dad, Barry Craig Jr., was a sailor. He was aboard an LCI, landing craft infantry. He was stationed at Pearl Harbor before he shipped out to the Marshall Islands campaign. He returned to Pearl Harbor uh, late in the war. We witnessed irony almost everywhere in Hawaii. Uh, our United Airlines flight from Los Angeles landed at the at Center for Daniel Inouye International Airport, which adjoins Hickam Field, Hickam Air Force Base which is a prime target in the Japanese attack. As we taxied to the gate, we passed a number of Japan Airlines jet, passenger jets that were of course made in the United States. On the hiking trail to Kaina Point, I'm sure that's terrible Hawaiian pronunciation, but uh, it looked like Kaina to us. As we were heading back from the point where the uh, famous uh, albatrosses are, we encountered a Japanese couple uh, who seemed to be about our age. And we wondered, as we chatted amiably with them in English, were they thinking, did those Americans, did, did their fathers fight against our fathers in World War II? Uh, throughout Honolulu, if you've been before, the streets are thronged with Japanese tourists, very popular destination. There are signs in Japanese and English everywhere you go. Uh, how I got interested in this book, uh, to write this book, it's a pretty long process. When I was in high school, at Mayfield High School many years ago, I read a book called uh, Day of Infamy by Walter Lord. It's a tremendous account and I recommend to your Zoomers, whatever you call folks listening on this, that they get this book and read it. Uh, it's filled with literally hundreds of interviews of, of Japanese and American uh, military people as well as, as civilians uh, there, there in Honolulu an amazing account. It's just absolutely top flight social history. And uh, so when I went to work with the, my first career was a journalist uh, and I always was a journalist who taught and not the other way around. But anyway, um, when I went to work at the paper in 1976 uh, in August, I thought it would be really interesting to try to write a, a Pearl Harbor story. And so uh, I was talking to one of my performer professors at Murray State, uh, Dr. Jim Hammock. He sent me a list of uh, Pearl Harbor survivors. 
And uh, I looked to see, were there any in our area? And there were a number, but the one name literally leapt off the page at me, a man named James Allard Vessels, the ship, the USS Arizona, which as you know, is the most iconic of all the warships lost on the day that President Roosevelt called the date that will live in infamy. I phoned Mr. Vessels up when I interviewed him and I never will forget on the way back to the newspaper, I thought this was absolutely the most amazing story I may ever write at, at the newspaper. Uh, for the next 11 or 12 years, I wrote, I, I found Pearl Harbor survivors and, and wrote stories about them uh, for the paper. This man's story was again, absolutely incredible. I was astonished at the clarity in which he remembered what happened. He got up, he put on his uniform, which before the war, the Navy in the tropics, they wore short pants. He put on a pair of white socks, black shoes, white shorts, a white t-shirt, went to chow, went topside on the battle wagon, the Arizona, to play a game called AC Deucey. It's a Navy card game on the anti-aircraft deck. At about five minutes to eight Hawaii time, and it was a gorgeous Sunday morning in, in, Hawaii, in Hawaii. Of course, every day in Hawaii is gorgeous. At least it was when we were there for the 11 days we were there. General Quarters Battle Station sounded. Uh, his first reaction was, why in the world is the Army Air Force practicing attacking our ships on a Sunday morning? It's liberty, a day off for him. But he dutifully pulled on a life jacket uh, a helmet, the, and that was the old, the, Navy, the, the Army and the Navy used the old British style helmets in 1941 and went to his battle station. It literally was the loftiest perch on this ship. The Arizona had two masts, the foremast and the main mast. The main mast was the, was the rear mast and it was taller. His battle station was a platform atop the main mast, bristling with any aircraft machine guns. It's called the bird bath, 90 feet above the water. To reach the bird bath, there are no elevators, of course. You clamber up stairs and ladders. Now, a 90 foot, a climb that tall would be pretty taxing under normal circumstances. But try to imagine scrambling up these, these, these stairs and these ladders under fire. Men are being shot off these ladders and stairs above and behind him. He reached the bird bath, as did his fellow machine gunners. And when they got there, there was no ammunition. This was peacetime. And in, in peacetime, military regulations call for ammunition to be, to be locked up. He didn't remember how long they were up there, but the next thing he did remember was an enormous explosion, absolute ear-splitting, earth-shattering explosion. He was dazed. For how long, he doesn't know, but when he came to, he was sitting on the floor or the deck, I guess, of this thing with his crewmates. The blast had blown all of their clothes off except their skivvy shorts. They got to their feet and looked out toward the fore part of the ship, and it was gone. A specially made Japanese armor-piercing bomb had torn through the deck and exploded in a magazine. It lifted that battleship and it weighs thousands and thousands and thousands of tons. It lifted the forward section of that battleship approximately 50 feet into the air. And when it slapped back down, it triggered a wave 12 to 15 feet tall that washed over Ford Island. Now the Arizona was part of a procession of capital ships known as Battleship Row. They were moored alongside Ford Island pointing toward the uh, harbor entrance. Obviously the Arizona was done for, the ship sank onto the harbor bottom. And if you've seen photographs of the Pearl Harbor aftermath of the attack, you know that these battleships, their main decks are above water. So you can see that uh, it didn't go completely under. Now the USS uh, Oklahoma capsized, was torpedoed and capsized. So on the way down, uh, James Allard Vessels and his crewmates uh, noticed on the searchlight deck. Now a battleship has enormous searchlights for night action. And he saw his first dead body. It was an officer 
in his whites, his dress whites, lying face down on this platform with a uh, pair of binoculars around his neck. And, and he said that the heat from these flames had curled back the soles of his shoes. At some point in this attack, he was hit in the leg by strafing fire, a bullet. And believe it or not, he cut it out with his pocket knife. Pretty tough sailors back in those days. Um, he got off the ship and that was his Pearl Harbor, Pearl Harbor experience. In 1971, he and his wife returned to Pearl Harbor uh, for the 30th anniversary of the, uh, the attack. And he went out on one of the boats to the USS Arizona Memorial. And if you've been to Pearl Harbor, you know it's a white structure that straddles the ship. It does not touch the ship. It straddles the ships. You can peer through the windows and you can see the outline of the ship in the harbor, the rusty remains of it, and uh, bits of fuel oil still seep up. They call them the tears of the Arizona. He looked on the inside wall. There's a list of all the men killed aboard this ship, sailors and Marines. He was looking for a particular name and he found it. The man's name was Lightfoot. That was his partner at AC Ducey that early morning, halfway around the world from his home in Paducah. Well, you might say, how could you top that story? Well, maybe I didn't. But the second Pearl Harbor survivor I interviewed was a man from Lone Oak, which is a Paducah suburb. His name was Jim Hamlin. He was on the USS California, another battleship on Battleship Row. Its nickname was the Prune Barge because the Navy received from the state of California enormous quantities of prunes. No doubt the California sailors were the most regular seamen in the whole United States Navy. When I went to interview him, the first thing he said was, do you know anyone who's ever read his own obituary? And I said, no, I can't say that I have. He says, well, I have, let me show you. And he showed me a yellowing clipping from the Harlan Advertiser newspaper. He was, had been a reporter uh, at the Harlan paper before the war started. And it was about a memorial service to him. As it turns out, he of course is very much alive. Now, he also showed me a telegram that the Navy sent his father we regret to inform you that your son has been killed in action. And then he has another telegram that says, we made a mistake. Your son is very much alive. Now, this is 1941. And I used to admonish my students, don't look at history through 21st century eyes because you'll be, it'll be distortions. Now today, what will we do? Get on a cell phone, send a text message, send an email. That couldn't, couldn't happen back then. So this actually happened more than once. A, a number of, of uh, stories in my book are about, about the telegrams that arrived uh, and about some telegrams that the second telegram came. I also have in my book, a story of a central Kentuckian. And this is absolutely the most horrifying thing imaginable. First came the telegram, your loved one is dead. Second came the telegram, we made a mistake, he's alive. Then came the third telegram, he is dead after all. You can't imagine the emotional roller coaster that these families went through. The first telegrams usually arrived about a week or a week and a half after Pearl Harbor. You can imagine what a horrible Christmas these folks experienced. And you can imagine what a joyous Christmas it became when the, the letter, the, the telegram came saying that your son is actually alive. Um, so from there, I proceeded to write about a number of folks, uh, and I don't want—I don't want to give too much away. You won't buy my book. Uh, anyway, I, I, some of the stories were, were, were absolutely amazing. Uh, there was a sailor uh, who was on the USS Raleigh, a cruiser. Now in World War II, battleships were named for states, cruisers for cities, and other ships for individuals and various things. He was on the USS Raleigh in the head at five minutes to eight, December the 7th, 1941. Now, if you're a Navy veteran or the son of a Navy veteran, you know what the head is. It's the toilet. He was literally caught with his pants down. A torpedo dropped from a torpedo bomber, crashed through the church launch, hit the Raleigh in the side, blew the ship up, raised him about a foot and a half off the toilet, and down he went. 
that had to be a special experience for this fella. Another sailor uh, on a destroyer had just bought himself a brand new Louisville Slugger baseball bat. And he was on the fan tail or the rear of the ship taking practice cuts at a game that afternoon when the attack began. He said he never knew what became of his bat, but he said his crewmate said that he threw it at the Japanese planes. Uh, getting back to uh, Jim Hamlin very quickly, uh, this attack caught everybody by surprise, literally everybody by surprise. No one in the United States military, no one in government thought the Japanese could do this. They knew the Japanese were about to strike, but they thought it would be the Philippines, Guam, Wake Island, uh, the British possessions in the Far East, the Dutch possession in the Far East, but no one had any serious notion that they could do what they did. Of course, as I would remind my students, history is full of amazing, amazing surprises in warfare. I'll bet that the Romans were quite surprised in the ancient days when Hannibal got his army across the Alps and was in Northern Italy before they knew it. And then of course, if you study Roman history, you know he, he romped and stomped in Italy for quite some time afterwards. Um, so again, I, I, I kept searching these folks out. So, so I've got a base of about 12, 12 interviews to go with. And then I began to do the serious research uh, wonderful resource, a resource you probably know about called newspapers.com. And I thought, well, I'm just going to try this. So I typed in Kentucky and Pearl Harbor. And I mean, I got hundreds of hits. Many of them were actual uh, contemporary newspaper accounts, the Lowell Courier Journal, the Mayfield Messer, the Paducah Sun Democrat, it's papers all across the states. Uh, You've probably seen in old movies, uh, a kid yelling extra, extra, read all about it. And a lot of students probably don't know what an extra is. Well, the Courier Journal and the Paducah Sun Democrat put out extras that day because people were so hungry for news of this attack. Word reached Kentucky in, in about mid afternoon. Now, how did they hear it? Was it on television? No, the television era is about a decade away in 1941, the radio. And what's interesting also, uh, in, the, in 1941, not that many Kentucky farms had electricity. So most of the electrical plants were in, were in towns. And so people who had radios in the neighborhood, neighbors would come and gather around, or they would gather around the car radio. And of course, the first bits of news came in were very sketchy. It came in in dribs and drabs after that. And so the newspapers, the dailies, decided, well, we can try to flash this out. At the Paducah Sun Democrat, uh, one of the editors, a man named Ed Paxton Jr., who was editor of the paper uh, when, I was, when I was hired in in 1976, he happened to have forgotten something and he was in the newsroom. A phone rang and a man on the line said, Ed, I just heard on the radio that the Japanese have bombed Pearl Harbor. Well, first thing Ed does is go to the Associated Press wire and he flips it on and sure enough, it starts to chatter. Uh, WPAD radio, he called them up. They said, we'll, we'll share the information with you. Then he began to round up reporters to get them in on a Sunday afternoon to get this extra out. Um, one of the reporters was a man named Mitchell. And uh, so one of the other editors went to search for him, couldn't anyone went to his house and said, oh, he's out taking a flying lesson. So he drives out this little airstrip near Paducah the plane doesn't have a radio. He has to wait till he lands to tell him what had happened. And Mitchell's brother was in the Army Air Force at Pearl Harbor. These stories absolutely are unbelievable. And the, the detail that these men went in, and not just men, women. I interviewed a woman, uh, uh, the spouse of a sailor, and she was completely clueless. They lived about 12 miles from Pearl Harbor uh, off base. And she heard all the noise and the explosions. She didn't know what it was, had no idea what it was. Um, interestingly enough, our Uber driver who took us from Waikiki Beach, our hotel out to Pearl Harbor, the first day we were there, we, we, he asked me why we were here and I told him. And he said, you know, my grandmother told the story about holding my father who was an infant and looking toward Pearl Harbor and saying, look at all the beautiful fireworks they're doing today. They had no idea what it was. Uh, it was a hammer blow. People in Kentucky were astonished. A lot of people didn't know where Pearl Harbor was. 
Uh, back then, the only people who've been to Hawaii were rich people or, or, or movie stars, people like that. You might know where Pearl Harbor was from a uh, National Geographic. Interestingly enough, though, if you look at the Courier Journal before the attack, uh, there was a man named O'Chiltree, I believe that's why you pronounce the name of the reporter, who wrote some, a really interesting travel log, and then he wrote a second long piece about what would happen in Hawaii uh, should the war come. But again, uh, I have in my book a, a, a letter to the editor from a, a man at Pearl Harbor, apparently a sailor, it didn't have his name, um, who said that, uh, that there, we have no fear of war here, that if the war comes, and it probably will, it's going to be in Europe against the Germans and the Japanese. Um, so I sat down to write this book. I, I stitching it together using these 12 or so interviews I had as a base. I then expanded it. Uh, there are a number of uh, universities, uh, University of Kentucky, uh, as well as Eastern Kentucky has an excellent archive of, uh, of accounts of the attack. I used that. I used uh, newspaper stories. Uh, tremendously interesting. And, and again, I keep uh, sitting here thinking, um, these stories that keep coming to mind, uh, some of them are, are almost comical when you, when you think about it. There was a, a, a man, army army engineer, and uh, they were uh, building a building barracks at a marine base air base, and uh, of course on the night of December the seventh was absolute terror for people in Hawaii. They believed, and you can understand why that this air attack will be followed up by an invasion, which would make perfect sense. Now, if you really were clued into military strategy, you would have known there was no invasion in the cards. Why? The biggest defense force on Oahu was the Army infantry based at Schofield Barracks. They didn't touch Schofield Barracks. It kept a strafe a little bit here and there. And by the way, if you've seen the movie, from here to eternity with Burt Lancaster and Deborah Carr, the famous scene at Helona Beach, you know, where the water washes up. I and mean, of course it was also parodied an airplane, uh, but they were, they were not after uh, Schofield Barracks. They were after Wheeler Airfield next door. Likewise, the Japanese pounded all the Navy and Marine air bases. They, they clobbered uh, Hickam Field, uh, which adjoined uh, Pearl Harbor, which told you one thing, they knew that to achieve success, they had to have absolute air superiority. And they got that. They got that. So again, but that's easy. Hindsight's always 20, 20 is and historians have always got, got the, all the answers. But anyway, that night was absolute terror. Uh, back to Jimmy Hamlin, he told me that, that um, he got off the California, survived and uh, spent the night on Fort Island. And this chief pet officer said, if you move anywhere in the dark, you better be singing or, or speaking English as loud as you can. So he said he went around singing a song. I think he said it was, oh, what a friend we have in Jesus or something. And please shoot me at the end of every verse. Please don't shoot me. Sorry, at the end of, I misspoke. Now, one of the great tragedies of, of the Pearl Harbor attack happened on the night of December the 7th. And it involves a man from Louisville, a Navy ensign named Herbert Hugo Mingis. Uh, he was a Navy pilot, a little wildcat fighter off the USS Enterprise, a carrier. Now, the Enterprise, the Japanese really wanted these American carriers. They weren't in port. That was good fortune for the home team. It arrived back at Pearl Harbor. The, the Enterprise began to immediately search, send his planes out to try to find the Japanese invasion fleet, and it, go, it was gone. And so during World War II, it's very difficult to land planes at night on a carrier. Uh, it, I don't have anybody can land a plane on an aircraft carrier in, in those conditions. Now, today, it's a lot more mechanized, a lot more computerized. World War II, it wasn't. You slid the canopy back and you watch this guy with paddles standing there trying to mimic the, the position of your plane. Anyway, so they couldn't land on the Enterprise. So they were vectored to land uh, at Fort Island on the airstrip, the Navy airstrip. Now, they radioed ahead that there were six planes coming in. They were American planes. They were friendlies. Uh, they're going to be flying low and slow, flaps down, wheels down, landing lights on. They are friendly planes. No way an enemy plane would come in like that. You can guess what happened. The word went out to gunners, do not shoot. Do not shoot. They did. 
and Hubert Her Her and Ensign Mingus was hit. His plane crashed in flames uh, at a place in Pearl City, a place called the Palm Lodge. His body was burned beyond recognition. The only way they identified him was with his wristwatch. Now, what's interesting is the Navy, I don't know when the Navy said what really happened to him. They knew, of course, but they also knew this would be terrible for civilian morale if this American was killed by friendly fire, which he was. Um, all the accounts of his death I read in the Courier Journal, it all, it just simply says he was killed at Pearl Harbor. Uh, in 1943, the Navy named a destroyer escort, the Mingis. Also named a destroyer escort, the Leopold, for instance, Robert Leopold of Louisville, who was on uh, the USS Arizona. Uh, in fact, the Filson has a collection of the Leopold letters where his parents are absolutely distraught, trying every way they can to figure out what became of their son, what became of his body. Uh, he is still among the more than 1,000 men entombed in, in the Arizona. Uh, the uh, Mingus, Mingus is buried, I believe it's called the Green Lawn Cemetery. It's on Preston, I believe it's Preston anyway, in Louisville. And again, th these stories, I kept coming up with these stories one after one after one. I thought, you know, I got to wrap this thing up because I don't want this book to be a thousand pages. But uh, so the, uh, again, the, the purpose of my book was to basically duplicate what Walter Lord did only concentrated on Kentuckians. Now, I, I made Kentucky a, a, Kentucky a pretty broad uh, definition. You don't have to be a native of Kentucky. You don't have to be living in Kentucky when the war began. But if you, if you settle in Kentucky afterwards, and a number of these guys did, I put, put them in the book, which, which I think is fair enough because you're a Kentuckian if you live here. Um, so, and again, not just Navy, Army guys, Marines, and civilians um, as well. And so after, so again, I, I want to stress my purpose, of this book was not to get into this controversy over who was to blame over Pearl Harbor. Um, the Navy commander at Pearl Harbor was Admiral, Admiral Husband Kimmel, who was from Henderson. Um, the Army commander was General Short. Again, my purpose was not to, to blame or to exonerate these men. That's, that's, I'm a, that's, I left that to other historians, Gordon Prang and other well-known historians to do that. Um, nor did I delve into that, to that, that foolish stuff about Roosevelt conspired uh, to, to have Pearl Harbor bombs to get into the war to help the British. That's also absurd. And I'll, I'll leave that to these other conspiratorial flights of fantasies. I just wanted to tell the story of these remarkable men and women who were caught at the crossroads of history in this incredible event most of them joined the service because the depression was hanging on in Kentucky. Um, Jim Hamlin went to Louisville from Hazard to, to, to sign up. And so on the application, he had to say, why are you joining the Navy? And he said to get something to eat. And this chief petty officer thought that was hilarious and he read it out loud. And so Jim said, well, all you guys laughing at that, you're here for the same reason. Um, and one can only imagine, one of, the, one of the most interesting aspects of this research was their impression of Hawaii. Now, even if you haven't been to Hawaii, you've seen Hawaii Five-O, you know Hawaii doesn't look anything like Kentucky. So here you get these guys. One, one, side, one fellow was from uh, Ohio County. And why did he join the, join the Army? Because nothing was going on around in Ohio County. And a lot of them joined for the adventure of it. A lot of them were single men uh, and just really thought this was going to be a high adventure. And it was like this tropical paradise they'd read about in National Geographic or seen in the movie Neutrals, and they, they were there. They absolutely loved the place. It was just a case. Now, one exception was, it was a, a, I believe it was a, he's a Navy guy. And he said that he couldn't get American music on the radio. The only program they had was singing Sam the Coca-Cola man never heard of that but he said he was he wanted he he what he was tired of Hawaii music he wanted to hear more American music as he put it um, another interesting aspect was there was a the school for the deaf in in Honolulu which had a connection to the Danville school uh, some of the professors there ha had gone uh, to the Danville school and you can imagine these kids completely had no idea 
uh, what was going on. A lot of these kids, of course, a lot of people in Hawaii, as you know, are Japanese Americans. And um, this, there, was a, there was a count of the attack in the Danville School for the Deaf newspaper in which one of these old kid, he was about 15 or 16, was a Japanese American. And he slept with an iron bar next to his bed because that if the Japanese attacked, he wanted to be ready to, to hit him in the head with this iron bar. Um, so anyway, so I pitched this book to the, to the University Press of Kentucky. They liked it. And so it came out. Um, but again, this is not my story. This is their story. Uh, now, one thing, Lord, Lord did not talk about the home front. Lord strictly focused on, on the, the Pearl Harbor attack. And I do encourage your listeners to, uh, or viewers, Zoomers, to buy a copy of that book. It's a tremendous book. But I wanted to get into the home front because I'd heard stories. Uh, all uh, these kids, this generation, well, we remember my generation. We remember what we were doing when Kennedy was shot, when, when Martin Luther King was shot, when Bobby Kennedy was shot. Now these younger kids remember what they were doing at 9-11. But Pearl Harbor, my dad was, was sitting on the porch listening to the radio. Uh, my father-in-law was in a truck making a delivery from his family store. All these just incredible church, they were in church services all across the state. Uh, and it's amazing, and I, I think people find it somewhat amusing, is how Kentucky reacted, <coughs> excuse me, on the home front. Now. You don't need a geography lesson to know how far Kentucky is from Japan or Germany or Italy. But uh, the Kentucky powers that be were convinced that Kentucky was in danger of uh, air attack, sabotage. So in Frankfurt, our state capital, not long after Pearl Harbor, they decided it would be prudent to have an air raid drill. Now, even if you're not an expert on World War II vintage airplanes, you know, there's no plane that, that the Germans had or the Japanese had that could fly nonstop from Tokyo or Berlin to Frankfurt, but they had an air raid drill anyway. And so unlike in London and these other cities in Europe, they didn't have a proper air raid siren. So somebody hoisted up to the top of a building, an old steamboat whistle. Well, the locals kind of took it as a joke. Uh, there's a really funny story about it that I included in my book. Um, about the, these air raid wardens trying to get people to, to cooperate and to take part and do what they were supposed to do. And they kind of did. Uh, there was one funny incident about a, a preacher, a teetotaling preacher who ducked into a liquor store. They thought that was hilarious. And then the bizarre part to show how innocent people were, that they went into downtown stores and they sat inside plate glass windows. What's the worst place you could be in a bombing attack? next to a plate glass window. Those shards of glass would become shrapnel instantly. There was fear of sabotage. Uh, people guarded roads and bridges uh, all, all across the state. Uh, there were laws passed uh, to execute enemy agents for acts of sabotage. I did run across an incident in which a young man was arrested and charged with sabotage. Uh, he was not an enemy alien. He was a young guy from Louisville who had to work on Christmas Eve. He didn't want to work. He was drunk, according to the story. And so he threw some metal parts into a machine to make the machine break down so he could go home. He got two years in prison for that because the judge understood he was not uh, an enemy agent. Uh, on December the 8th, which was, of course, a Monday, I mean, literally, the doors of recruiting stations were knocked off. Thousands and thousands of Kentuckians and across the nation volunteered uh, to fight in the war. Uh, a lot of them were World War I vets. Uh, they wouldn't take them because they were too old. There was one World War, one War II, World War I vet who said, okay, I'm too old to go. So he went to the nearest fire station and volunteered to be an auxiliary firefighter. Um, I can't stress enough how unified the American people were in favor of this war. Uh, if you studied American history, you know there was a good deal of isolationist sentiment in the country in the 1930s. Uh, we got into World War I late in, in 1917. The first American soldiers really didn't see much action in 1918, but it was enough experience uh, to convince a lot of Americans anything would be better 
than another world war. And of course, that led to the very tragic appeasement policy on the part of the British and the French, who suffered a whole lot more than we did. We were just as isolationist as they were. Pearl Harbor, the Pearl Harbor attack wiped out almost all the isolationist sentiment in the country. Uh, we've never fought a war again in which public opinion was, was absolute, almost 100%. Uh, I used to tell my students, uh, those of you who are interested in joining the DAR, the Daughters of the American Revolution, be careful how you shake that family tree because a patriot will fall off one end and a Tory falls off the other. There were a lot of Americans who fought for Mother Britain in that war. War of 1812 had considerable opposition, especially in the New England states. The Mexican-American War had great opposition in the Northern Free States. Civil War, that's obvious. Uh, world War I, uh, in fact, World War I was so divisive, we had a, a, a prop what amounts to a propaganda ministry in which we rename things patriotic. For example, sauerkraut became Liberty cabbage. Uh, hamburgers became Liberty steaks. Uh, German breed dogs were Liberty pups. And my favorite was rubella. The German measles became, yeah, you guessed it, Liberty measles. None of that stuff went on in World War II. Um, people pitched in. Uh, they planted Liberty Guard, uh, uh, Victory Gardens. Everything was rationed, tires, gasoline, sugar all sorts of important things. My mother was on the ration board here in Grace County where I, where I live. Uh, tremendous, tremendous uh, uh, unanimity, if you will, uh, for this war. And so I wanted to devote a chapter on that, just to, on, on the home front. And uh, that's what, what I did. Uh, I wanna make sure I'm okay on time. Don't wanna run over, don't, don't wanna run over in that. Uh, the, uh, Going to Pearl Harbor today, and I recommend, if you get a chance to go to Hawaii, and, and by the way, okay, I'll be honest with you. I didn't spend all my time interviewing Daniel Martinez at the National Park. We were known to do a little swimming at some of these fantastic beaches on Oahu. But if you go, the, the, the National Park has a tremendous museum. And what's interesting about this museum, it tells about the Pearl Harbor attack uh, from both perspectives. And uh, uh, Mr. Martinez told me that that was kind of edgy at the time because no one wanted to hear the Japanese perspective of this. Uh, one, of the most, one of the interesting things I discovered, uh, when I was a kid, I built models, not very well, uh, built a model of the USS Arizona. Well, what color are, are battleships? They're gray, right? No, the USS Arizona was blue, was painted blue, sort of a medium blue. And the top of the gun turrets are painted red, so they would be identified from the uh, from the air. Uh, that was something that I did not know. And there's an enormous model of the USS Arizona in the National Park Museum, and it's painted blue. Um, Daniel Martinez was part of that incredible, very interesting discovery there. Um, I wish my dad could have gone back to Pearl Harbor in his latter years. He didn't, just to see if he could recognize anything. Um, the, the only thing he would have recognized was the Royal Hawaiian Hotel, which was the poshest hotel in the islands. It's called the Pink Palace of the Pacific because it's pink stuccoed. We went there and uh, during the war, the Navy took it over. And uh, I think you could stay there for like 50 cents a night. And uh, he remembered staying there when he was on Liberty. And uh, Waikiki Beach was barbed wire covered. Um, on Fort Island, there are, uh, there's an air museum that's fascinating. That it shows many aspects of the attack people don't realize. One of the things that the Japanese were very, very innovative in this attack. Uh, for example, the Americans believed there was no need for, for any for anti-torpedo nets. And these are torpedo nets are, are metal nets designed to stop a torpedo. Well, the Americans said we don't need those because the Pearl Harbor is so shallow, no torpedo in the world can operate at these depths. Well, guess what? The Japanese fixed little wooden fins on these torpedoes that enabled them to drop in the water at a much shallower depth and do horrific damage. The deck of a battleship is, is so reinforced with armor that bombs drop from a normal plane, a uh, normal uh, uh, carrier-based bomber wouldn't penetrate the decks. So they specially modified naval shells, made them into bombs, and that's what destroyed the Arizona. Uh, remember Pearl Harbor. 
became a battle cry. Like remember Fort Sumter. Uh, it also spun off a song. I won't sing it. That would pollute the ears of your listeners, no doubt. Uh, but the song is called Praise the Lord and Pass the Ammunition. And it was uh, put on sheet music. In fact, when we were going through some things at uh, my, my mother-in-law's and my father-in-law's house, we found that sheet music. It has a Murray, Kentucky connection, which is unknown to a lot of Kentuckians, including a lot of Murrayans. The man that that song goes back to is the Reverend Howell Forgey. He was a Navy chaplain aboard the USS New Orleans, nicknamed the No Boat. Um, and he joined the Navy from the pulpit of the Murray First Presbyterian Church. He found a bride in Murray, a young woman from uh, Caldwell County uh, in the choir. So on the morning of December the 7th, 1941, he, well, he wrote this absolutely amazing account of the attack. It's, it's called And Past the Ammunition. He wrote it with a reporter who probably helped him. But anyway, it's a tremendous book. It is absolute riveting detail. And in this book, when the attack begins, he's kind of, it's Sunday. So you can kind of sleep like you can kind of loll around a little bit. So he's lying in his bunk and he's daydreaming, looking through a porthole, which he said was a Maxville Parish circle of blue, which is very, very good. That's good stuff, as we say in the newspaper business. And he's thinking Murray, Kentucky. His mind is on Murray, Kentucky. He's thinking, okay, it's about time church is out. Uh, said that, uh, that, that the college kids will be going over to the hut, a popular campus restaurant to have a hamburger and a Coke. Uh, old Mr. So-and-so will be getting in his Model T and heading out to his farm. He talked about how, how he had so much enjoyed Sunday dinner at the farm with, with the old guy and his wife. And then all of a sudden, this attack begins. Uh, now, as a chaplain, under the Geneva Convention, chaplains cannot do anything, anything at all offensive in a battle. They cannot pick up a gun. They cannot pass ammunition. They cannot fire a gun. They can't do anything except offer spiritual guidance to the men in battle. Well, the USS New Orleans is, is under fire. Uh, it, was, it, was in, it was in dock, and, and it was on auxiliary power from the dock. And if you know anything about the Navy, uh, these ships, all this stuff, it, it, it's electric cables coming in from the power plant ashore. Well, as this ship attempted to escape, uh, the power cables were cut. And when that happened, guess what happened to all the shell hoists and all the guns? They wouldn't function. So they had to pass these heavy five-inch anti-aircraft shells up steps, hoist them up by ropes, a really, really hard job, especially under fire. And so the Reverend Forgy is going around encouraging these men so he slaps them on the back, and someone said, allegedly, well, Padre, guess we won't have church today. And he said, well, praise the Lord and pass the ammunition. Now, what's interesting is when this song came out, the parson, the Padre, puts down his Bible and fires a gun. That got Forgy into huge trouble because he had violated the Geneva Convention. There was an, another an, another chaplain that uh, was also got in trouble for it. Make a long story bearable. He 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 did say it, but he never touched a gun. And I thought that was one of the most interesting stories. Uh, his uh, there's a picture of him in in my book, and uh, his taken for the, the all the the pastors at the Murray Church on the wall, which is like many 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 churches do. Uh, I don't want to take too much time. My wife says it's about time out. I've done a little TV, so I know about this stuff. You, you, got, you got to stop. But I would like to conclude with a quote from Tom Brokaw's book, The Greatest Generation. If you haven't read that book, you really ought to, because it's about the greatest generation. And I would include the greatest generation, not just Americans. I would include British Canadians, Free French, Australians, Soviets, New Zealanders, Allied soldiers. They were all in this greatest generation. And I think that, that kids today just have no, no notion 
of World War II. I mean, I used to tell my students, I thought everybody's dad fought in World War II and looked at me like I was crazy. But it's such a pivotal moment in American history. My parents would always couch things as before the war or after the war. Well, since World War II, we've had Korea, Vietnam, and the Middle East. But Brokaw wrote this tremendous book. And let me see if I can't find my notes here. I'm not used to doing this stuff on, on the TV like this. But anyway, the, uh, uh, I'll, I will leave you with a quote in the book, which is the last line in, the, in my talk today. I should have told you all in advance that I was not going to subject you to my normal hour and 15 minute lecture, unlike my students. And you're not going to be tested on this either, so relax. But he said, I'm in awe of them, meaning the greatest generation. And I would hasten to add too, that I was privileged to interview a number of World War II veterans. Sadly, they're all dead. Uh, one in particular was a man from Mayfield. In fact, we live in his house. Uh, he was in Europe, fought in Europe. He won a, a silver star and a French Croix de Guerre with Palm. And he was a real war hero, but like all real war heroes, they say they weren't heroes, even though they were. And he told me, he said, you know, it didn't matter what you did in World War II, whether you were never left the United States in the military or you did some civilian job, you were part of the effort. You were part of this greatest generation as Tom Brokaw called it. And I remember after writing the story about Jim Hamlin, uh, he came into the newsroom a, a day or two later and he brought me a little Christmas fruitcake. And he said, thank you for telling my story. And I said, no, sir, thank you for letting me tell your story. But to wrap up with a quote from Tom Brokaw, he said, I'm in awe of all of them, all of them. And I feel privileged to have been a witness to their lives and their sacrifices. And I do too. Thank you all for listening. Well, thank you very much. I enjoyed that immensely. And I know we've got a number of really excellent questions in the chat. Um, so I'm gonna dive right into a number right. of them. Um, I know you had mentioned that that you you did not set out to uh, uh, to to seek uh, blame or or credit where it might have been due, but but a certain famous son of Kentucky uh, did. And Alvin Barkley was chairing the congressional investigation into Pearl Harbor. Was that something he sought out to do, or did that that fall to him just by by seniority, or how did that come about? Well, to back up a little bit further. Uh, after the Pearl Harbor attack, the American people were stunned, and rightly so. They wanted answers. So President Roosevelt appointed a panel called the Roberts Commission to investigate uh, the attack. And they went to Hawaii, and they took testimony from uh, Kimmel and Short, I believe, and concluded in the end that these men were guilty of dereliction of duty, which is a very serious military charge. Uh, both of them, they were not, neither were court martial. They were allowed to retire and they left the service. Um, they of course had their defenders, uh, after the war was over, Barkley did indeed, as you said, chair this panel. And with the panel concluded that while mistakes were certainly made, they were not guilty of dereliction of duty. I assume he chaired it because he was Senate majority leader. Makes sense. But a really fantastic question. Here, do you know if any of the veterans that you interviewed saw the movies Midway or Tor Tor Tor, any of the cinematic depictions of the attack, and, and did they have any thoughts about those? Yes, uh, J.C. Riley, the man who had the baseball bat, he saw it, and he said it was very realistic. But he said he thought they concentrated too much on the battleships that there were other ships sunk. Now, along those lines, James Vessel's son Mike joined the Navy in the 1960s. And he was a gunner's mate like his dad. So they were on the East Coast, they were going to Vietnam, but they were gonna stop off in Honolulu, or Pearl Harbor on the way over. And so he uh, went to a hospital, he recovered and the Navy flew him out to meet his ship. And of course, of course he beat the ship to Honolulu by a number of days. So he comes to Pearl Harbor and he cannot believe what he's seeing. All of these World War II Japanese planes buzzing overhead, explosions in the water. They were making the movie Tora, Tora, Tora. And he saw that. And he said, this is what my dad experienced on the real deal. I thought that was an incredible coincidence. You know, I used to tell my students, you know, 
you don't have to make this stuff up. It's in history. There's no point in making it up. It actually happened. Uh, but they are, yes, uh, uh, J.C. Riley did say it was, it was very realistic. Now, he did say he didn't like the foul language. Not that as a sailor he hadn't heard that, but uh, I'm anyway, sure we'll let that go. <laughs> um, got a really excellent question about um, the the rebuilding and reconstruction efforts to get some of these ships back underway. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Do you have any accounts of Kentuckians participating in those efforts? Well, I don't exactly, but I will tell you this: shortly after the Pearl Harbor attack, there were are, there were uh, uh, appeals in newspapers for for skilled workers to go out mm -hmm. to ship fitters to work out there. Uh, the one thing, and that's an excellent point you brought up, uh, the planner of this Japanese attack was Admiral Yamamoto, who was a very outstanding military commander. Now, according to sources, historians disagree whether he actually said this or not, but apparently he said that I can pull this off because the Americans have no notion we can do this. They don't think we can do this. No nations ever sent six aircraft carriers across the Pacific Ocean to attack. Because you have to remember naval warfare. What's the queen of naval warfare? The battleship. World War II, it's not. The battleship becomes escort for carriers. And so what Yamamoto told these Japanese militaries, the government, that he said, uh, as, as, and again, this is, it may be apocryphal, but it's kind of the gist of it. He said, I can run wild for six months, maybe 12 months. After that, I have no expectation of success. Well, I used to tell my students, six, let's say six months. Six months was the Battle of Midway, the turning point of the Pacific War. Uh, the Japanese sent six carriers to Pearl Harbor. Four of those carriers were at Midway. How many survived? None. They sunk them all. We lost one carrier. And so I doubt the Yamamoto said, I told you so. But he was so feared. Well, this is one of the most amazing exploits of World War II. This man was a fanatic on punctuality. If he said, I'm going to be there at 801, that's where he would. Well, these obviously mathematical people studied uh, where he was going to fly. And these P-38 fighters intercepted at the precise moment and shot him out of the sky. Uh, he was very well respected. He had spent time in the United States before the war. Uh, it is also attributed to him that he said that this attack will awake a sleeping giant. Uh, the Japanese were astonished at how quickly these ships were rebuilt. The only ones that were lost was the Arizona and the Oklahoma. Uh, the California, for example, uh, uh, Jim Hamlin was, was, uh, went, went to, well, he was, he, he had a, a second ship sunk out from under him, hmm. a cruiser. So he's at the Battle of Tarawa on a troop ship. And guess what he sees? The USS California. And he said he cried like a baby and yelled, go get them, prune barge. But the, the Nevada, got to remember how to pronounce that's Nevada, not Nevada, as we remember. But all these battleships were, were rebuilt. Some of them were, the ones that were, were, were more inboard didn't suffer a whole lot of damage. Even the West Virginia, they were raised, they were put back together and got back in action. It was, the Japanese were astonished at how quickly the United States could transfer from a peacetime economy uh, to, a, to a wartime economy. Suppose the Japanese said, and the Germans said, all the Americans can do is make refrigerators and razor blades, and that uh, Americans are soft. Uh, they call us, the, 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 the Nazis call us a mongrel nation. And what amazes me, and again, I, I'd love to stress this, we beat them with a citizen army. They were professionals, and we beat them with a citizen's army. My father-in-law was a grocery store guy. My dad was a minor league baseball player. And we beat them with that. So I guess the, the, the lesson, one of the lessons of Pearl Harbor is, well, on the American side, is never underestimate a very potentially powerful enemy. And on the Japanese side, man, this was a big mistake doing this in the end. We've got a lot of really great questions and, and really anecdotes in the chat um, about family members who oh, yeah. um, had enlisted, you know, before the attack on Pearl Harbor and in, in the service somewhere. I, I speak as the the grandson of uh, of, of a, a grandfather and his younger brother who lied about their age to enlist early in yeah. January of 41. And I, I'm, I'm wondering quickly, really quick. Let me I tell you a story about that. There was a young fellow uh, from Kentucky. Uh, who was an in the army and he shot down a Japanese plane and they kicked him out of the army because he lied about his age. He was 14. Yeah. They sent him home. He worked with his dad in the shipyard. Then he went back overseas 
And I did some research on this guy, and he must have been quite a soldier because he won a silver star in the Purple Heart of Europe. So he was pretty – but can you imagine? You shoot down an enemy plane, and they kick you out. Oh my God. His dad said, look, my son lied about it. I only come home, and he did. But anyway, but go ahead. I didn't interrupt. Well, I, I was wondering about Kentucky in particular and, and thinking about coming out of the Depression. You know, is there something about, about Kentucky that has us overrepresented at somewhere like Pearl Harbor uh, more than our national population just because of the, the, the way that we were hit so hard by, by the Depression? Well, that's an excellent question. And I've been asked how many Kentuckians were at Pearl Harbor. I have no idea. And there's no way of knowing. And I'm quite sure, and I look forward to seeing emails from people saying, you missed my great-great-grandfather. Well, yeah, I did. I mean, I did the best I could to find these. Uh, one thing I would like to point out before we go is uh, the military in 1941 was segregated, just like society. Opportunities for African-Americans were very limited in the military. If you went in the Army, you could be a cook or a truck driver or some laborer. If you went in the Navy, you could be a cook or, or you could serve on as a, as a cook. So rap, ma massive discrimination. So you, if you're African-American, you couldn't join the service to escape Jim Crow segregation in Kentucky. But I did find a man from Grace County who was in the Army. He was a cook at Schofield Barracks. He was a very small, wiry man. And so he was in the, in the kitchen, uh, not even called the galley, when the attack began. And there was a huge oven that was switched off. He crawled inside the oven, and that's how he rolled out the attack. Uh, which was an amazing story. It was told to me by his great, great nephew. Uh, but uh, again, one thing too, if you, if you do have a relative at Pearl Harbor, and in fact, the cover of my book shows a man named BC Kid from Mayfield. I played softball with his son. He has one ribbon on his uniform and the, you can't, it's black and white, but it was a yellow ribbon. It's called the American Defense Service Medal. And it was given to those in the military before Pearl Harbor. And if you look really closely, there's a little bronze star on that ribbon. That's for Pearl Harbor. And that is something that was noticed after the war. And another thing too about Pearl Harbor, for a lot of these guys, this was their first of many, 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 many battles. I think the New Orleans had something like 17 battle stars. So, you know, you live through this and think, I ought to get a pass now. Mm -mm, most of them didn't. They went on to fight in these battles, battle in the Pacific. Absolutely. I'll, I'll point out for everybody watching um, that uh, that Barry's email is in the chat. If you have any follow up, if you've got a family story you want to share, any questions or anything, um, follow up with him there. That email is in in the chat window. I would wonder for our last question, if you might give some reading recommendations to our audience. Yes, I can do that. We can do a little show and tell if you like. I've got some books here. Uh, Craig Nelson, Pearl Harbor, From Infinite to Greatness. You can see that. That is a really outstanding book I used. Uh, this one is really good, too, by Steve Twomley. Twomley, sorry. Countdown to Pearl Harbor. That's a good one as well. Uh, this is one of the real classics. It's Gordon Prang's At Dawn We Slept. Uh, Prang died, and the book was updated by two of his students, Donald Goldstein and Catherine Dillon. Really, really good book. But if you really want to read what got me fired up, go, go to eBay and find you a copy of uh, Walter Lord's Day of Infamy. Tremendous reading, tremendous reading in there. And that, that's what I sought to do, was to duplicate what Walter Lord did with Kentucky. And I, I really look forward, and let, let me apologize to folks if I don't get back to you as soon as possible. My wife and I are in the throes of moving. We got to be out of here by the 14th of this month uh, so it may be a few days, but, but be patient. I'd love to hear your stories. I mean, who knows? Maybe I'll have a vlog. <laughs> vlog That's right. Probably not. But anyway, I'd love to hear the stories. I really, really would. Well, that's fantastic. And thank you for your generosity and being open to, to receiving those. Thank you for a wonderful presentation tonight. You. I've really enjoyed it. And I know everybody else has too. Thank you very much. Y'all have a good night.